friends, what, what a blessing you are. Uh, yeah, those were actual tears. It's not the rain that was <laughs> raining on me, but uh, on behalf of uh, Alice, Kara, Keg, and I, I just want to sincerely, sincerely thank you for what you've done to us. Yeah, thank you for your prayers and your support. Yeah, we've really felt your and received your love. As you may know, uh, Alice is not feeling well. Uh, she has not been feeling well for the last uh, 10 days or so. Uh, she has uh, shingles, uh, shingles of the eyes. Uh, I'm told those are the worst form of shingles that you can ever get. Uh, I would like to wish on any one of you, not even the best of my enemies. Uh, it is horrible. It's really, really horrible. And uh, yeah, but uh, she's she's a strong lady. Uh, she's on the mend. She's improving slowly by slowly. Uh, and we really thank God for that. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your text messages. Thank you for your calls. Uh, many of you have offered to do so many things. Thank you so much. Some of you have offered to be picking our kids from school to your offered to do play dates with our kids. Thank you. Thank you for the meals that you have provided for us. Uh, it's been good not to cook this week. Uh, we, uh, we've eaten a lot of amazing food, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for, you, for providing for us. Thank you, Kasti, for organizing for that. Uh, this, someone this week, I'll not mention the name, just rocked up at my door. Uh, this week and said, hey, uh, uh, well, I'm already here. What can I do? And they vacuumed the house, folded the clothes. Uh, what a gift that was for, for me. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I usually cry over other things, you know, like when I see a lion being killed and stuff like that. But for whatever reason, as you we were singing Cornerstone, uh, I couldn't stop crying. <laughs> I should be laughing. Uh, but... <laughs> What a week this has been. This has also been the week we have uh, celebrated one year since we actually moved to Nelson. We landed in Nelson on 10th of February. I started as here on uh, 1st of March. Uh, what a year it has been. But this is what I've really come to appreciate about St. Stephen's. Uh, uh, I used to, I, I, you normally say that we are a warm and welcoming church. We are more than that. We are a caring church. We care for one another. And it is, I am glad that I am part of this church family. So thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I'm not the only one who uh, can testify of this. Uh, just the last couple of days, we have lost two of our very faithful members, uh, Colin uh, Bartlett and uh, Jean Patterson. Uh, it's been a long, rough, long week, especially for their families, for Muri and Nikki, for uh, Jean's ex extended family, having those two funerals uh, back to back. Uh, but you guys really showed up, you loved on them. Uh, thank you so much for the support. You have demonstrated what it means to, to love one another, to love Christ and to care for one another. So thank you. May the Lord bless you richly to the excess of your sacrifices. What, let, let's pray, let's pray. Good and gracious God, I'm so grateful for everyone here today and anyone who is joining us online. I just want to thank you for them. I'm so grateful for this church family. And Lord, I pray that you bless each one of them. May each of them deeply know of your love. And Lord, now as we turn our attention to your word, Lord, speak to us. We believe that the Bible is inspired of you and is profitable for us today. So Lord, we pray that you'll take these truths from your word and plant them so deep in us. Shape and fashion us into your likeness so that the light of Christ may be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O oh Lord, speak. And fulfill to us all your promises, your purpose and your glory. Teach us, Lord, what full obedience is 
what holy reverence is. True humility tests, O Lord, our thoughts and our attitudes. Cause, O Lord, our faith to rise. Cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Lord, that let the truth of your words just, and that your grace prevail over our over our unbelief. Speak, Lord. Renew our minds. Help us to grasp the heights of, our, of, of your plans for us. Good and plans for us. Remind us this day of your grace and your promises. And help us, O oh Lord. Help us to believe in you more. To trust in you more. Increase our faith as we walk with you and you with us. We pray this for our good and for your glory. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So we continue with our sermon series, The Way of Jesus. As um, I had stated at the beginning of uh, this sermon series, my goal and my desire, my prayer for each one of us, uh, really my theme, if you like, for this year is that we will follow Jesus together following Jesus together, and we'll be on this for a good long while, following Jesus together. And we have just started from the beginning what the, about Jesus' invitation to follow him. Uh, and we, over the last couple of weeks, have been looking at what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow him? And I started this sermon series by looking at the roadblocks to follow Jesus. And I just picked one from uh, uh, First uh, John chapter 2 from verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the eye, uh, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life or the pride of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from this world, from the world. That is, the philosophies, the uh, systems and structures that rule the world that are against God's way of life. The world and its desires pass away, but wh whoever does the will of God will live forever. And so we started by that. Here is a ro be aware of these roadblocks to following Jesus Christ. We live in this society that prides itself, that tells us to pride ourselves in uh, what we have and what we have done, what we have acquired, our accomplishments. We live in a society that tells us left, right, and center, it's okay to last, uh, to, 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 to have the last of the eye and last of the flesh. These are real blockers to following Jesus Christ. And then we went ahead and looked at Jesus' invitations to follow him. Uh, at the beginning of his uh, ministry on earth, he started, in, we looked at Matthew chapter uh, th th 4, when Jesus says, come follow me. Simple yet exceptionally profound words. Come follow me and I will change you. I will transform you into fishers of men. And then we looked at Mark chapter 3 last week when Jesus said, come and be with me. He called the 12 to be uh, he called them to himself. Um, we saw that Jesus' strategy is very simple. Jesus' strategy to change the world, to have impact in the world, is really very interesting. It is to invest in a few so as to impact the world. He chose just 12, and those are the ones that he invested in them. And, and that's a model for us to follow, um, to invest in a few so that they may have impact. But then also he, he called very ordinary people to himself. And uh, we ended last week by asking, do you feel ordinary? You are in the right space. Jesus wants you. And so today, uh, the phrase that we are looking at is, come and trust me, as we have seen in Luke chapter 5. Now, let me just give us a background of what is happening here. It is the early times of Jesus' ministry. Um, Jesus in chapter 4 has been led by the Spirit into the wilderness, into the desert, where he was tempted. And after 40 days of prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit led him um, out of the wilderness into his hometown called Nazareth. And there he, he went to the synagogue and uh, he uh, 
proclaimed his mission statement uh, and he was just quoting something that had been um, prophesied of him about 700 years before that by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 61. Jesus says, his, here is my mission statement. Here is what I have come to do, to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the parishioners, to recover sight to the blind and set the oppressed free, to proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor, to proclaim jubilee. Um, and so he, he quotes his, uh, his mission statement and the guys who are listening to him, are they are full of praise. But as he continues to explain why he has come on earth, the response by the guys in the, in the synagogue uh, moves from praise to fury and before long they want to drive him out of the city. They actually take him on the cliff wanting to throw him uh, uh, down the cliff and he miraculously walked um, in between the crowds and left Nazareth and went north to a, a fishing town called Capernaum. Capernaum is um, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And while Jesus is there, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's, uh, he's uh, chasing away demons. Uh, he healed Simon's mother-in-law. You see that in uh, verse 38 to 44 of chapter 4. And so Simon has heard of him, he's interacted with him. Uh, Jesus has even healed the mother-in-law. And so that is the background by the time you're getting to chapter 5, when Jesus has his uh, longer, um, con uh, 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 longer conversation with, with uh, Peter. So here is, Peter, here is Jesus at uh, some bi Bibles will say the Sea of Galilee or uh, the version that we have read, the, uh, the Lake of Gens uh, 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 Genesaret, um, for no extra charge, fun fact, uh, Lake Genesaret is a, almost the same size as Lake Wanaka, okay? So Jesus is there, uh, not at Lake Wanaka, at the Sea of Galilee, okay? Are, are we st still together? And so he's there, and he's teaching the crowds. And then in verse 2, um, it reads, Jesus not, noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Now, notice how Jesus engages Peter in a very, 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 very simple way. He's like, Peter, I see you're working. You're not using the boat. Can I, please may I use your boat? I, I need to speak to the crowd. And uh, probably I could use your boat as a platform. Uh, so uh, would you kindly just uh, push the boat a little bit into the water so that I am on the sea, uh, on the boat, and then I address the crowd? Again, like last week, remember, Jesus is like... Uh, the Tahuna Beach, uh, he's not quite there, but gives you the image. He's on a boat there, and there's a crowd on Tahuna Beach. So it's something like that. So he is, for him to be able to address the crowd, he has to uh, get onto the water a little bit. And so he um, asks Peter, could, could I use your boat? Um, do you see how Jesus starts to engage Peter? He interrupts Peter from his work. He's like, basically what Jesus is asking uh, Simon, and at this point Luke decides to use the name Simon, um, could I use your boat to bless others? Could I use your boat to bless others? Jesus interrupts Simon in the midst of his work. He was washing his nets. And then he gives him, he asks for this small request. So here is a first application. Allow Jesus to interrupt us. Jesus interrupts us in the midst of work. Has the Lord nudged you this week about something, about someone? As, as you are shopping or you're at your workplace, at school, you're taking a walk, and he has probably just nudged you by his spirit. Uh, would you consider praying for that person? Would you ask him? 
or her how they are doing? Has Jesus, inter uh, through his spirit, interrupted you with a little request? How about just smiling at them and going to ask them how their week has been? Uh, just get out of what you're doing and take five minutes during your tea break at work and have a conversation with that colleague. Uh, how about making a prayer for them? For Peter, he was interrupted in the middle of washing his nets. And then there was a little request to push the boat into the water. So, consider this week how the Lord might be inter interrupting you in the midst of your work and making small requests, requests for you to do. Then in verse 4, when Peter had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down there your nets to catch some fish. Then with a cynical voice, Peter replies, Master, we have worked hard the whole night and you didn't catch anything. You meant to tell me that we can go back into the deep and catch some fish? I mean, Jesus, what do you really know? Really? We worked the whole night. Where were you when we were working? We got tired and frustrated. We have no fish. Do you know what that means for us? I have nothing to take home. I have no food for my family. I have no food to sell. That means I don't have wages for today. I mean, this is, this is a bad day. And you have the audacity to ask us to go back and fish. Actually, the best uh, practice of fishing is that we fish at night, Jesus. Remember, you're a carpenter. Stick to your lane, buddy. <laughs> uh, do, do the preaching and teaching. You're good at that. Let the fishermen do the fishing. I mean, with all due respect, but well, because you said so, because you said so, you know, you, you healed my mother-in-law, I've seen you preach, I've seen you do miracles, you have chased a demon or two, maybe we might have a fish or two. So, okay, Selavi, we'll go back into the deep, throw in our nets and see what will happen. Uh, be prepared to be proven wrong. That's just my imagination. <laughs> but have you ever, ever worked so hard on a task, so hard on a, on a project, put your, your passion, your heart and soul into it, and then it did not yield anything? This was Simon's ex experience. That's what they just experienced. But Simon thinks, oh, well, because you're crazy enough to ask us to do it, we will do it. And so verse 6, it says, And this time their nets were so full of fish that their nets began to tear. A shout for, they shouted for help and, uh, and asked their partners to join them to bring their boats. And their boats, too, were filled with fish on a verge of sinking. Same method, but now done in broad daylight with, great, with the greatest results. The catch was that there was a big catch, a really big catch. Now, uh, I've never been fishing, okay? Uh, but I do see people who go fishing on Rocks Road. Uh, there's a night I was walking there, and uh, there's, there's a gentleman that I found who had just caught five fish. And he was really excited. He even showed me the fish that he had caught. And he told me the story of how he caught every... <laughs> I mean, I was there for a while. <laughs> uh, so that's probably the closest to my fishing experience. Do we have people here who have gone fishing? Any one of you who has gone fishing? Oh, thousands of hands across the room. Thousands of hands. Any one of you... Uh, now, for you who have gone fishing, you, you love fishing, uh, what's the greatest catch that you've ever got? 
when you went fishing. <laughs> okay, Ion is pointing at his wife. <laughs> he went fishing and caught his wife? Or did you go fishing and you... Okay, okay, and you got a big fish. One big fish. Okay, cool. More than one. How many did you get on the... Okay, okay, cool. Ah, using a net or using a... Okay. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, what's the greatest number of fish that you ever caught in one... And by the way, how long did it take you when, when you got your greatest... Eighteen. Eighteen. How long did that take you to? Oh, a couple of hours. Couple of hours. Oh wow. Okay. Anyone who beats that record? Anyone? Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> yes. A round of applause to the to the lady. <laughs> yeah. Fifty. Whoa. Okay. Okay. Gavin, do you beat that record? Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, what's the legal limit? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, and, Tony and Gavin, how long did that take you? Uh, oh, that took about two hours. Two hours? Yeah, six, hours. six hours, wow. Uh-huh. We got 60 blue collars, two hours. Ooh, okay. And how long did it take you? Oh, a couple of hours. But that was way back when you could get 60. Okay. <laughs> Well, hey, please, a round of applause to these people, man. That, that's amazing. That, that is awesome. But I have news for you. Uh, if uh, that, that was nothing compared to what we have just read. Next time you go fishing, you need to go with Jesus. And you will catch way more than 60 or 45 or 18 in a shorter period of time says the guy who has never gone fishing. <laughs> For these people, this was a shock that they were able to get so much fish in such a short period of time. And then they had to call their partners, John and James, come. These were their, their fishing buddies, their business partners. Come with your boats. And there was so much that this, the boat was about to sink. <laughs> My question is, how much fish does it take to sink a boat? This must have been a lot of fish. Now imagine with me, here is a fisherman, and in that context, fishermen were poor, uneducated people. Okay? So here's a poor fisherman, not a great uh, career choice back then. Most were uneducated and poor. Uh, they, had, they had had a long night. Simon had had a long night, tired and frustrated. Uh, uh, and he would have loved to catch some more. But now he has caught a catch of his lifetime. A lot of fish. Now think with me, if you are an entrepreneur, what would you do? You go and sell this fish. <laughs> there was actually a crowd that was there. And so imagine the profit that Peter would have made if he sold that fish to the crowd. That's the natural thing to do. You have been fishing the whole night. You have been tired and frustrated. Now you have fish. The human thing to do is what? Sell the fish to the crowd, make a profit, uh, probably even just uh, provide the whole market with the fish, the, heck, the whole region with some fish. Uh, probably you'd market it like this is fish that was, has been provided by Jesus. It has extra nutrients, extra omega-3. This is a real deal. You need to have this kind of fish. If I was Simon, that is what I would have done. I would, made, I would have made a profit. I probably have dreams of re retiring early and touring the world. That was pre-COVID. <laughs> but Simon does none of that. His response is rather weird. He is, one, he's amazed, he's awestruck, but then he goes to Jesus and bows down to him and says, Master, I am but a sinner. Get away from me. Now that is a strange 
response. What is the relationship between the fish that he has caught and his sin? What's the relationship between... Have, have, did, did you read that? Did that? I read that and I was like, just a minute. Why would you respond like that? It is because he was more amazed, not by the fish that he had got, but who Christ was. Amazing response by him. Here was a professional fisherman, surprised, awestruck, amazed by what Jesus had done. The catch was not as important as what it had showed him about Jesus. And so the question I have for us is this. When you experience God's provision, does it lead you to worship him? Or is your reaction, well, I, what, I got what I wanted, I'm out of here. Like Peter, the appropriate response in acknowledging how God has been gracious towards you given you strength and wisdom to make what you have made is to come before him in reverence. Jesus said to Simon, have no fear. Have no fear. From now on, you will be catching men. After that, they had, they had bought, brought their boats to land. They left everything and followed him becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example. Why is Jesus telling them, do not fear? You see, fear in its full range. Fear is real. Fear comes in the form of, uh, in the simple, uh, uh, in the simplicity, in the simple form, being nervous, it can grow to being anxious, to, being, to a point of panic, even to a place of paranoia. Fear is real. But what fear does, it hinders our ability to trust. Fear is the enemy of faith. Fear clouds our visibility of Christ. It deafens our ears of what he has to say. So Jesus tells them, Jesus tells Simon, John, and James, and he tells us today, don't allow fear to rule your heart, to rule your hearts. It will hinder you from genuinely believing, trusting, and following him. Jesus tells them, you will now not catch a multitude of fish, but capture people with my good news. Is fear holding you back from believing Jesus? Instead, you doubt him? You no longer take Christ at his word? Is fear holding you back from trusting him? Do you find yourself being suspicious of Jesus? Is fear holding you back from unreservedly following him? Do not fear. Now you no longer catch fish, but capture men and women with the good news. After they had, verse 11, after they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example. So Jesus, having addressed their fear, the disciples believed, trusted, and followed his example. Imagine after such a provision, they let it all go for the sake of Christ. It's like winning a lottery and you decide, you know what? I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to have it. Try me on that. I'll take the money. But Peter, James, and John were willing to let go of their source of income, 
their identity, their source of influence, their boats and nets which were their investments, their property, their possessions to follow Christ. And they did this at the height of their career. They got the most fish that a fisherman will ever get. At the height of their career, they were willing to let go of their income, their investments, their influence, their property, their possession for Christ at the height of their career. Because Jesus was calling them to something greater than themselves. Would you? This, my friends, is actually Christianity 101. At the beginning of this sermon series, I did ask if Jesus came calling and asked uh, for something from you, what is this one thing that you really struggle giving up for the sake of Christ? And we said, that could be your idol. Now let's take it a little bit farther on. Here is Jesus asking them for everything that they had and had. And they left their income, their investments, everything for Christ. Would you? Would you if Jesus came calling? Now, Jesus is not the kind of, <laughs> he's not the kind of guy who is a joy killer. But he wants more for you that he knows that you'll find more pleasure in him because of who he is more than what he gives you. And so if Jesus came and asked you, would you give up of your income, your investments that you have worked so hard for, for such a long time, if he asked for your property and your possession, if he asked for your boat, your batch, your BMW. Would you give it up for the sake of Christ? Friends, let us hold lightly the things of this world. Not with a closed fist, but with an open hand. Open to receive from Christ, and the Lord will bless us. And the Lord has blessed us, but also open to let go because the same Lord gave you the wisdom and the strength to have what you have. These are the basics of what it means to follow Christ, that we are totally sold to him and reservedly willing to give up what we own and who we are for his sake. Not because he's a joy killer, but because he wants you and I to live for something greater than ourselves, for him and for his cause, for our good and for his glory. Let us pray. Just before I, I pray, I just wanted to tell you, friends, this day you can choose to, to look at the pain of leaving the stuff that you own, but you can also choose to look joyfully to what Christ has for you. Lord, I pray for each one of us here today. This is a challenging message. Lord, I personally struggle with it. I do. But Lord, I pray that starting with me, you'll give us, strengthen us, open our eyes to what greater things that you have for us. Lord, I pray that we will bring our fears to you, O oh Lord. 
Lord, that we will place everything that we are, have and are to you, O oh Lord, that you may use for your glory. So, Lord, help us to know what it really means to follow you, to believe in you, to fully trust in you, to have faith in you. Lord, open our eyes to the greater things that you have for this community, for this city, and for our lives. If only we could trust you, believe in you, and unreservedly follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.